audience has the ability to weigh in during each section. So we'll, we'll pause, we'll take our events and feedback from everyone in the room uh, each step of the way so that we're not making people wait till the end to, to get their comments in. That said, um, I'm going to, in just a moment, start the overview of the briefing book that was put together. Um, we're going to run through this fairly quickly. It is not to rush the process, but it is so that we can get to some of the deeper dive issues that I know a lot of the folks in the room want to talk about. For example, the place management organization, and I really don't want to hold up the day on some of the history. Before we do that, um, I don't know if we've got everyone back in the room, but I could take a minute and ask um, the, the folks who are providing um, translation services to come up to the microphone and introduce themselves um, in the language so that anybody in the room who may not be um, able to understand what I'm saying knows that those services are available to them. Buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación en español, por favor, si me hace saber, alguien va a hablar con nosotros para hacer la interpretación. Thanks very much, and we'll likely do that a couple of times throughout the night, so the folks who are here um, for the day bear with us, but it's important to capture all the, the new uh, folks that we have. I anticipate we'll have a larger crowd starting around the dinner time hour, so uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for us to uh, make those introductions again. Okay, so everybody received a link with the with the briefing book uh, in the email I sent out. If you did not, you should have a paper copy with you right now. It's um, like this. And uh, I worked very closely with city staff to try to compile a history of the work that's been done around Union Square that impacts the way Union Square has been developed, the, the different initiatives that have taken place, but I have to make sure I say that with the caveat that I'm sure there is something I have missed, um, and I'm sure there are different ways to look at this. However, we thought that the best way for us all to get on the same page, we don't know everybody, we don't know everybody's background, was to have a starting point. So that's really what this briefing book is. It's a starting point. And I apologize to the group that I'm standing over, but I'm going to have to use the computer to, to advance. The way that I'd like to do this is I'm going to run through the general categories um, of what the briefing book consists of. And given the lack of time that we have, what we're going to do is ask you to jot down, if, once you have a chance to review it, it doesn't have to be today, but once you have a chance to review the briefing book, if there are things that you think I have missed, or that the city and I have missed, please send them to me, and I will compile an addendum that I distribute to everybody, so that we make sure we're capturing everybody's perspectives. The briefing book is a compilation of work that exists today, We've included all the links and references to where we have found that information. Uh, and the first section talks about the, the strategic planning for Somerville. Apologies, I'm going to follow along. Yes, the wrong. Sorry, technical difficulties. Hang on one second.
So the first section goes through um, just a very general overview of Union Square, including its history, what some of the makeup of Union Square is today, and an overview of uh, some of the very unique features that make Summer Bell uh, what many regarded as the innovation city. Um, as we've talked about already, and a couple of people here have alluded to the interesting change in dynamic that has taken place over Union Square's history, starting as a commercial hub that was focused around transit, to the disinvestment that occurred as cars became more prominent, uh, 93 was run, uh, and Union Square experienced some disinvestment, um, job loss, but the, the but Union Square has seen a lot of revitalization and some really innovative and creative industries take hold here, um, as we all know. And so we we provided a little background on what that looks like today. We next uh, went through a number of the planning, visioning, and zoning exercises that have either recently been completed or are currently underway. Uh, this is not a full historic review of all of the different planning exercises that have happened for Union Square, but what we have tried to do is touch upon some of the major ones that are directly going to be impacting the work that we're doing today. So everybody, uh, or many people in the room, will be familiar with Summer Vision, Somerville's comprehensive planning document, the Union Square Revitalization Plan, which is an urban renewal plan, which uh, gives the city some unique powers to help aid in the rede redevelopment of Union Square. We looked at future development of Union Square, the Union Square Neighborhood Plan, which we're in the midst of here, the existing zoning, and the zoning, the Somerville-wide zoning overhaul that has been discussed, and <coughs> will likely be very much informed by the process that we're conducting today, and neighborhood plan. References to all of those documents, summaries of all of those documents are in the briefing book. I'm happy to go through them in more detail or we can schedule a time with the, the planning department who are the experts in these uh, documents to go over them. But the one thing I wanted to just pause on is the core principles outlined in Summer Vision. Summer Vision does a great job of taking a very broad look at what the goals for Summer Vision, Summerville should be, and particularly for what the city should do in focusing on the transformative areas. So those core principles are something I wanted to touch upon, make sure everybody was aware that they exist in case you hadn't seen them before, and those will likely be uh, a, a good place for us to start many of our conversations about where Union Square is going and the prioritization of different elements. Next, we gave a brief history of the master developer process. This is for folks who may not have spent time uh, over the last several years working through the request for qualifications that the city issued in looking actually nationally for a master developer for several of the parcels in uh, the Union Square area. Um, as we all know, Union Square Station Associates, US2, was selected. So we talk a little bit about what their background is, what that organization has done. Um, and then we included a very, very brief summary of private development economics that was part of a presentation given at a CAC meeting that describes generally the dynamics that are faced when a, de when a development project is put forward and all of the different forces that have to come together to make that development feasible for both the community and the private development interests. Infrastructure is a very important and critical topic and so we've included a, a section on infrastructure. Many people are very familiar with the Green Line Station uh, and the recent news that have, that's come out uh, around funding for the Green Line Station. We've included some background there. Uh, but the other thing that, and perhaps it's because it's of personal interest to me, 
we've included information on the other infrastructure improvements that are going to be needed to help Union Square develop. We, are, we live in a, a state where much of our underground utilities are very old and in many cases crumbling. And it is important for folks who may not spend as much time as I do thinking about roads, water, sewer, bridges, <coughs> intersections, to think of that as part of the public amenity package that needs to be addressed. Uh, because without those things, no, no development can move forward. And really rebuilding and making the infrastructure adequate to what um, the, the community wants to see in Union Square will be a very critical element of being able to advance uh, the plans for Union Square. We discussed public spaces and civic buildings. This is something we, we heard actually in the introduction um, as a very important part of what makes Union Square and Union Square. Uh, and there has been work done by uh, Union Square neighbors and others to help gather community input about what public space and open space means to Union Square and what the goals and aspirations should be uh, to increase that within this area. So, Again, there are links and summaries of all of the work that has been done up until now regarding them, and hopefully that can start as a, a starting point for our discussions uh, moving forward. So then we uh, looked at the Somerville by Design community uh, participation process. And it was important for us to kind of point out that the locus process is not the start of the discussion here. Really, we are coming in uh, after many, many meetings. And so we wanted to give an overview of the, the various opportunities that the public has already had to be engaged and take note of the important feedback that's already been provided through those processes. So, Public meetings have been held. The CAC meets monthly. There's a number of other opportunities for stakeholder participation. Um, for example, the principles of design document that was compiled, I believe it was Union Square Neighbors and Union Square Main Streets uh, teamed up at one point to hold a couple of community meetings um, to help people articulate what design and development goals they wanted to see. Um, and we wanted to make sure that that becomes part of the conversation, and we wanted to make sure that people know that that work has been done. And it's, very, it's, it's great work, it's, great, um, it's a great document to reference as we begin our conversations here today. Simil similarly, the Somerville Community Corporation did a really comprehensive project in uh, Union Square East looking at working with the residents there, um, asking them what their vision for a Union Square would be, what they'd like to see as part of the redevelopment of Union Square. And so again, we reference that document because it's important to build upon all the work and feedback that's already been gathered as part of this process. So I encourage people to take a look at that if they have the time. We wanted to point out that there have been several other organizations who have already, um, groups and organizations that have already worked with the city of Somerville regarding social equity issues in Union Square. Uh, the first of which is the Sustainable Neighborhoods Working Group. Uh, as Joe has mentioned, uh, they've been hard at work on the transfer tax, but also cover a wide variety of other issues. Uh, and it's important to make note that there are a group of community members that have worked for, for quite some time to identify issues of priority for that group. MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, issued a report regarding displacement, uh, focusing <coughs> on uh, Somerville and Union Square and the Green Line extension. Again, great piece of work, something that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we do want to make sure we take it into consideration as we begin our discussions. On the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance had named Somerville and Union Square a great neighborhood and has been doing 
a lot of community building work to bring together different groups to help them articulate and move the ball forward on some of their priorities. And so it's worth noting that there are some very well established groups already on the ground working in Union Square on these issues. Lastly, and I know I've blown through this, so I apologize, but the last thing we did is we included uh, some citywide statistics and Union Square statistics. <coughs> we thought it was important to provide some context uh, for the group around what the current makeup of Union Square is, what those demographics look like, and give us a baseline to work from um, when we start our conversations. Um, so we have included that data, uh, but I'm sure we've missed interesting data points. And so I will wrap up my very brief overview by saying, if there is other information, other data, that you think would be helpful to you while you're starting to evaluate the strategy cards and decide how we're going to prioritize uh, the issue that you want to talk about with this group, please send them to me. And we will, we will do the research and we will get back to the entire group so that everybody has the benefit of that information. So if there are reports we've missed, if there are initiatives that are underway that you feel everyone here should know about, we, we agree. And so, Instead of taking people's time now to get that feedback, we'll, uh, over the next week or so, start compiling that information and send it to me, and we'll get it out to the group as an addendum to this, to this briefing book. At that, I'm going to pause and turn it over back to Chris, because what we really want to do is get into uh, the planning department, which is going to give a great overview on the neighborhood plan and the fiscal analysis uh, that So please get to Victoria. Any other insights, studies that everybody should know, so we all are up to speed. And um, so, any comments on the briefing book? Wig, and then Mary. Yeah, I, I have one that kind of follows on something Don said. Don said earlier, which is it would be helpful to have have uh, comps and references for similar districts, whether they're in Massachusetts or in other places. Uh, you know, if there's a quick reference that you can put together in a, in a page of those, that would be helpful. Similarly, with regard to city information, it's not as helpful to have just Somerville information as to understand Somerville's uh, relative place in the different categories of interest. And so it would probably be helpful to have some uh, references to the state uh, municipal spreadsheets or things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to think in the absolute because you, you don't recognize the compromises that you're talking about people having to make when they, they decide what to emphasize here. Right. So I'm not certain, Victoria, what we can do on the state level. We can make references to, uh, I'm on the board of the International Downtown Association. Um, I've been involved with setting up place management organizations, both personally and uh, as a consultant. So, well, I, I mean, Victoria has a quite good background in the uh, state yes, data, <laughs> and and actually, Massachusetts has some pretty easily accessible data on municipalities. I'm not sure that Victoria mentioned in her introduction. I, I don't think I heard it, but she was the governor's head of policy. So, yes, she does have. Ben, then um, Joe first, the and then Ben. Okay, MAPC, even though I know, wait, you've got a challenge with MAPC. I like that. Yeah, I, I understand. I was on the steering committee right here. Right. Ben? Um, I'd also like to see, uh, like what was saying, some of the trade offs, but also um, public benefit, what other groups have done public benefits, what were things that they've asked for, what were things, you know, that they've done after the fact, right. and how they've looked sort of a before. Didn't you have, wasn't there a list of community benefit agreements that was circulating here in Somerville? Didn't somebody do that? I've seen it. There are five or six of them. Union United has done that. United, there you go. In fact, about three of those deals were cut with locust developers. So, um, 
Yeah, we have an extensive sort of pack of information about CBAs, which I think would be really helpful to anybody that who doesn't have that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That'd be great. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Anything else? Okay. A anything from the crowd? Yes. The crowd. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Saki. I'm currently a master's student at Tufts in the Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning Program. Uh, and grad school is good for nothing else. It allows us to challenge the truisms that pass for kind of clear eyed common sense in rooms like this. So when you stand up in front of a room and say this is the big boys table, because you need to be able to understand the economics of uh, the development, but you only present one form of economics, which is like kind of fundamentally based on an idea that cities are shaped by solely by supply and demand, rather than things like institutional discrimination, then it's problematic. So I just want to bring that up, that it's something that's been missing from this conversation. <laughs> Benny, yeah. could you translate? <laughs> you might be an expert in many things, Mr. Leinberger, but maybe this one, not so much. Uh, I, what I take from what Joe just said, which I thought was very eloquent, I'm not sure actually why you're asking me to translate, but um, I think that a lot of the material that I looked at, at least so when I was reading, for example, the cards, the strategy cards, it seems to me that, you know, just as one tangible example, in those, everything is about, um, you know, market forces, like what's the market risk? Um, there's no part where it says, what's the risk to the community? What's the risk to, you know, my neighbor who works three jobs and can't afford their house? You know, it seems very sort of, uh, you know, it's from a, a particular uh, perspective, and it's framing the conversation in a particular way where it's like, you know, you get to kind of like point the camera where you want it, and you're pointing the camera at this question of market forces and of whatever. That's, this is, I'm just like speaking to my own reaction to this, um, the literature that we've been given. So I think there is a certain bent in the direction of, um, uh, you know, the experience of development. Um, and it doesn't seem to me that it, that, that bent is, you know, in favor of poor people, people who live here, people who work here. It's kind of, it seems to be more about like large amounts of money and where does it come from and where does it go and, you know, who gets to say what, you know, I don't know. Uh, one thing in response is, and, and, you, and you haven't heard this yet, but you will, <laughs> uh, right after dinner, is that one of the things that Brookings and GW has done, along with the Bar Foundation, is to look at the walkable urban places and the drivable suburban places in the metropolitan region and rank them based upon economic performance, which is what you've just been saying our entire focus is, and on social equity. And, the, and there is no performance metric I know of for social equity that anybody's bothered to come up with. And I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's the first cut at measuring social equity. So, you know, the concept is, is that the place management organization will be responsible for this place, working with all of you, and will be measured based upon their economic performance and their social equity performance. So, two independent measures. And hopefully someday there will be a public health performance metric, and, and, and there'll be an environmental place-based metric. But it works under the assumption that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we're trying to give the tools for the first time, to my knowledge, to measure social equity. And that's, hopefully, this will come out of this. That's why we're here. Yes. What I took from what Joe said, actually was echoed in something that Christopher alluded to at the beginning of this when he talked about growing up on one side of the tracks versus the other. Um, development is not just about money and ownership, it's about power and who has power and who doesn't have power. We're not the Deep South, fortunately. Um, I say that as someone who was born in the Deep South. Um, but you can see some of this in Somerville's existing uh, growth patterns. 
You know, the lots on top of hills are larger, the houses are bigger than those down in the flats, things like that. So I, I think it is really incumbent on us as we go through this process to be thinking about those issues explicitly, as equally as important as the fiscal issues, um, otherwise we're gonna miss the boat. And going back to Joe's comment that, that in urban history, we didn't have this kind of division. When, I've, when I do a presentation about how we grow our cities, the first thing I say is, where is the favored quarter, the favored 90 degree arc coming out of downtown? And you know where the favored quarter is because you know that's where the white upper middle class lives. And it's on the other side of town where the lower minority populations live. And, and there's 383 metro areas in the country and there's 383 favored quarters in this country. If you want to understand this country, look where the rich white folk live and where the local minority live and they're on the other side of town. And that's the paradigm that is, can now change because of this, because of what you're doing here in some of them. So, and income, you know, 100 years ago, you would have census tracts that had people in today's dollars making $10,000 per year and a million dollars per year living within a few blocks of one of them. Or like that. So, I mean, yes, more like that. Yes. Eric. Eric. I just wanted to say that uh, I think that everybody in the room is pretty comfortable with Somerville's socioeconomic position relative to like Belmont and Lexington and the, that favorite corridor as you speak to. Um, but I think that to quickly summarize, I hope, Joe's comments is that it comes down to a focus on property rights versus community rights, because this whole process is fundamentally based upon who buys the land and who owns the land. What are the rights of renters who have a say in the community? What's the right of the community and the ability of the community to say no, or no, unless you do X, because this is what is going on in our community. And so the question is, how can you take control? And the issue is, to use the economic tools that are being given to you to help the, generate the community benefits that you want, and that's what this process will hopefully surface. But um, it's going to take money. You, it, unless you want to pass laws that say, you know, we're going to tell you how to use your property. Um, so I always say that the people in this chamber aren't about to suspend property rights in the city of Somerville. We just need to figure out how to make it work. Scott, final comment, and then we have to move on because I know you want to hear from George and the neighborhood plan. Well, yeah, I just wanted to point out, I think that um, it is going to take money, and not all the money, but we have to keep in focus that we're, to an extent, offering some of the most premium, expensive real estate in the United States to somebody, and that there should be a real fair trade so that, that it's not necessarily always put back on us. How will you pay for it? Well, we, we need to ask those who are going to benefit from far away and nearby, how will you pay for the, the trade? You know, how, how will you pay for the land? You know? So the community benefits agreement yeah. process. Well, I understand, but it, sometimes the matrix is sort of like the burden is put on us. Well, if you want to park, you know, what's the deal? Well, you know, Let's make the whole D2 parcel apart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, that is largely in the power of well, the so municipality. You want to do that? I mean, not as a not I'm just I'm saying that there are. Chris, before we move on, I'm sorry. Jennifer has been chomping up a bit to say something for a while, and I just. I'm sorry, Jennifer. I just want to make sure. I I really like what Joe said, but um, and I wish I had said something sooner. But I do want to make sure in this room we're going to be working together quite intimately for a while and the the big boy table thing or the big K table or big whatever. Person. Big person. No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not jumping on the gender piece. Uh, what I am saying is that that kind of belittles all of the other processes that have already come about. And I, I, I've spent years of my life working on those other processes so I, I, and I know a lot of people here have. So I want to make sure that. But um, while we may not tell private developers what they can and cannot develop, we can say but you have to pay for it. 
and that payment is our community benefit. So I just want to make sure we keep we can we can create what the market is. That's where we are right now. So with that, I'd like George to come up and talk you through the neighborhood plan. Oh, Ben, I didn't see that. Um, just a quick thing, since a few people brought it up, can we see on these cards a social? Since you said you already did it with 25 cities, like some sort of mark of what does this mean socially in terms of social equity? You know, if we did X, if we picked this one, what does that look like in terms of social equity and things like that? You know, rather than my give it to you, giving it to you, what I'd love to do is hear it from you based upon the strategies you come up with, and let's put in there as a line the social impact of implementing that strategy. Because I want to learn from you as much as vice versa. So let's have a line on all the strategy cards as you're going through, which is social impact, expected social impact, and begin to identify what the expected social impact would be. And let's make it specific here, and then we can broaden it to the rest of the nation. Because this is supposed to be a model. So George has been, of course, working, quarterbacking the neighborhood plan been broad input into the process, and there's a timeline on it. So we have to recognize the the you know, fact that a lot of people have been having input in, into this, and there's a lot of things depending upon it from a time point of view. So we need to fold that into our into our strategy. All right, thank you, um, and uh, thank you all for coming out and being here. I, I, I have a couple of quick questions I want to ask everybody, including the strategy leaders and the audience. Um, how many people attended at least one of the Union Square Neighborhood Plan meetings over the course of the last year? Okay, how many attended uh, one of the three, at least one of, spent at least some time in our three-day charrette in March with us in the post office there that day? Okay, so a lot of you may be familiar with the work that went into creating this document, and, and, and I want to highlight some of the details of that as we go. Um, I'm very excited that we have this document out. We've had it out since the end of October. We've been uh, working on receiving comment and feedback from folks, and we've been getting some good responses. Um, we are um, continuing to seek out feedback. Um, I'm here to listen today to what you have to say about how the plan and the process and everything work together. Um, I am certainly open to the idea if folks want to share their concerns about the plan, but I will say that the most effective way to share a concern about the plan is through the process that we've set up through either the open comment site or an email to planning at SomervilleMA.gov. We'll pull all of that information together um, to produce to produce um, the complete plan, um, which we're working working to complete this calendar year. Now we've got a um, um, so there's 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 a lot here. I want to um, share with all of you highlights of the plan. We have some paper copies that are around with people. You, you got them right that you should have, um, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll go through some of the bits and pieces of this, but I think the, the key is that, that um, a lot of this um, is stuff that you've kind of been a part of all along, and we'll share how it has manifested itself in, in, this, in this document. Um, with apologies to Frank, because I stole yesterday's presentation that you already saw. Um, <laughs> presenting a lot, a lot of slides that Frank saw yesterday. Um, this is um, a, a couple of folks in our design team, principal group in UTL, who have been working for the city as part of as the city's consultants on, in this process, um, along with a number of others. US2 has been a partner with us through this process, but the process of the neighborhood plan goes well beyond the seven development parcels that, that US2 has been designated for. Um, so we've been looking at all these issues of placemaking, planning, and design, and I could go through all of this schedule, but I will merely say that we started with a crowdsourcing event in December 17th of 2014. We have spent the last year doing the visioning sessions, which we did in multiple languages, and we did twice, the development opportunities and constraint workshops, the design charrette in March, two open houses in May and June, um, and um, then follow up work towards uh, getting ourselves towards a neighborhood plan draft to, to release in October. Um, Union Square um, is certainly a, a significant and important portion of the city of Somerville. We created the, the district boundary within that. Um, the overall focus is on meeting goals of summer vision and um, some have pointed out that the Union Square plan exceeds the goals of summer vision. I, I think there's, there's two reasons for that. Um, one is that if you look at Summer Vision's data, it, um, 
it calculated, uh, um, it, it basically spread the growth across Interbelt, Brick Bottom, Boynton Yards, and Union Square. Um, we've realized over time that, that Interbelt in particular will probably take longer to develop and Boynton Yards will be a little bit earlier to develop. Um, we also realized that the Union Square Neighborhood Plan is a, is a, is a 20 plus year build out while Summer Vision talks about a goal for 15 years from now. Um, so yes, these numbers are bigger than the overall numbers, but, but, but the, the nature of time and the nature of its ability uh, to work. We never imagined that we'd finish summer vision and never build anything again. This, this does reach beyond that in time and, and in perspective, but the exciting thing about it is what it does, um, the most significant thing it talks about doing is it, is it does um, provide the opportunity um, for 10,000 new jobs. And, and, and that's um, a big piece of the summer vision jobs goal. Um, at the same time, um, over 2,500 new residential units. We've set more than 500, which are affordable because we're focusing on the summer vision um, calculations. Um, 12 plus acres of new open space, working on this 60-40 mix of commercial to residential, um, and really working on the strategy of kind of where and what happens um, with the Green Line extension. And, and I think the mayor says this more eloquently than I ever will, but I'm going to try, um, that we need to do planning because we could, we, if we don't do planning, things are gonna change. Things are gonna happen to us either way. Um, and if we don't do this planning, we may not be satisfied with the things that happen to us and the impacts that they have. Um, I think that, that with the, um, if you look at the regional housing need and you look at the demand for where, where, where people wanna live, and people wanna be in walkable, urban, interesting places, um, the long-term, beyond just the real estate cycles, but the long-term real estate demand um, is for more and more interest in living and being in places like Union Square. Um, there will always be more people interested in being there than, uh, than what we have available. We're working on a regional basis to try to address some of those issues. Certainly the access to transit makes it even more desirable. Um, we could choose to build nothing, and choosing to build nothing would, would leave us in a position um, where we would probably still see upward price pressure that's pretty significant, and at the same time, we would not get the, the potential to achieve the fiscal benefits and community benefits that come out of that. So we focused on the idea that we want to figure out what we can do, what makes sense, what's sufficient with summer vision, and what is sufficient with the community process that we've done. So it's important to note that the, the, the neighborhood plan is a product of the entire community. It is a product of the community process, of involvement we did through the meetings, through outreach, through multiple steps of making sure to, um, to do a significant amount of community engagement. Our first meeting, the crowdsource meeting, was based upon the idea of bringing together anyone in the community who came to that first meeting and not talking about the plan, but talking about who wasn't in the room, how we get them there, and how we grow the group of people to get more interest and more impact on what the plan is gonna be. Um, the follow-up meetings, we're about vision, we're done in multiple languages, we're done to understand where people were going. Um, I don't know how many people recall joining me on a absolutely freezing cold walking tour in January um, that were then followed by the design sessions in March where we had separate meetings on topics and talked a lot about the policy issues as well as the planning um, and the design discussions, did on-site design, did pinups, got feedback, we did that, um, that, that um, last night pinup meeting where we had so many ideas that we ran way, way over time, but we got all these concepts out there. We, we reopened the post office for multiple days to follow for people to stop by and give back feedback. We didn't get time to do so at the end of that session. Um, and then we came back in March. We did the outside events with the uh, food trucks and followed them up with meetings on various issues surrounding the, um, uh, surrounding where the community um, Wanted, wanted to be and what, what their feedback was, particularly on the physical design of the D blocks, the core union square blocks, and of um, Boynton Yards and the growth that could potentially occur there. Um, so when we went back to actually look at doing what should be in this plan, um, if you look at our early Somerville by Design plans, the ones for Gilman and Lowell Street, you'll see there's a lot of drawing and a lot of physical design stuff there. Um, the first, I don't know, 50 pages of this document or so, um, our policy recommendations. And, um, you know, as we've been talking with Chris about this process, um, they dovetail quite well with the strategy cards in terms of what the, what, what the priorities are. But at the same time, they also stand on their own as this was a capture of where the community was at that point in terms of what 
issues we thought were most important to us. And we think we got them right, and we're still open to feedback through comments on that. But I think that as time goes forward with this process, you may say, you may look at those policies and look at the other things and look at the strategy cards and say, well, of these, these five things are more important than these other three things, and therefore we want to prioritize. And that's fine. It doesn't make them any less important for the purpose of the neighborhood plan, but it does mean that those are the sort of things that we can use to find a strategy for addressing with community benefits. So. Um, I think it's important to note that um, while we're receiving feedback on the plan and we're moving that forward ahead of the conclusion of this process, the two do interconnect in a relatively good way. If this whole process leads to something where we say, oh, well, you know, the development should be different because it produces different benefits, um, I've got to go back into a commun community process to do that. We're working on trying to get the plan process complete. So, um, and, but what, whatever we do, you know, first and foremost, I don't think much that happens in the process of establishing what the priorities are of public benefits would, would change the plan beyond the feedback I'm getting now. Uh, but if it does, I, I have to make sure that it's something that the community as a whole is behind as well as just, just the group here. Um, so I'm moving on to get comments and feedback by the end of the month, but I'm also continuing to monitor this process to make sure the pieces continue to dovetail and work right in a way that works correctly. I want to go relatively quickly over what's in this big ideas policy section, just so that those who haven't spent a lot of time with it yet have had a chance to see the, the, the details of what's going on in here and, 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 and the, the intent here to be thorough. And, and even, even putting them up on a list doesn't, doesn't do it justice because you look at something that says develop an innovation ecosystem, well there's a specific recommendation on strategies and policies on how to do that. Some of these policies are policies that um, result in funding and need to be sort of looked at in the support of other public benefits and whether or not they make sense. Um, others are things that could be potentially wrapped into a regulatory zoning system when we build a zoning solution to implement this plan. Um, but so as you look at these, these are the ones about resilient local economy. A lot of them talk about developing the mid-sized business, developing the large business, bringing, bringing the 10,000 jobs there. But it also covers um, making sure that we're good to local artists, making sure we embrace urban agriculture, supporting entrepreneurs, attracting small business, and making sure that that is a part of the picture. Um, if you look at the strategy of managing a changing neighborhood, we uh, directly addressed some of the issues um, surrounding equity that, that, that relate to the housing side of this work. Um, making sure residents are integrated into this process, supporting the autonomy of existing residents and businesses, um, ensure housing is attainable. There's a lot of specific issues about affordability, about creating new affordability. Um, uh, I, I wanna specifically note something about where it said leverage resources to produce purpose-built affordable housing. Um, there was, there's been some back and forth conversation about the intent of that. I, I really encourage folks who are interested in this to look at that language very carefully. We have, over the last five years, generally done our affordable units on site. Um, that particular, there's particular language in the plan that says that there may be circumstances where shifting to off site affordable units might make sense, particularly where um, we're building housing that, that doesn't necessarily fit right for a certain family type, and you want more housing for that certain family type, so it may be possible to build more units or different units for that family type. It is very clear in there that we should only pursue such an option if we are definitely sure that the benefits of doing so far exceed any downsides. We've been very successful recently with requiring on-site inclusionary housing everywhere that we've done inclusionary. Um, I believe that in most cases that is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I continue to believe that. We left, we stated in the plan that we believed after doing a lot of policy studies on what housing types are good for families and good for young professionals and good for other types that if we can come out ahead, if we get more units, if we get more family units, if we get more opportunity, if we get better living opportunity, we should not shut that option off. Um, but there is not an interest in saying, okay, let's shift every affordable unit out of the D blocks and stick them somewhere else. That's not what that says. It's not what it's meant to say. If you think that's unclear, please, that's where I need comments on because we, we, we are trying to address those issues. Um, lifelong communities talks a lot about housing sizes and types needed for children, for seniors, for people at different points in life. Um, definitely, um, as we've started doing studies on housing needs, and we'll have more stuff we're producing related to our zoning overhaul, we've certainly seen that the 
largest demand for housing regionally is for millennial young professionals, but the housing demand exists across all areas. There's, there's housing demand need for families with kids. There's housing demand need for, for a variety of different areas, and a lot of them are looking for urban walkable places, too. Um, dynamic public realm, talking about streets as shared spaces. Um, in particular, one of the key pieces here is making sure to use opportunities to create shared streets and stuff to try to address some of our open space needs because um, the open space recommendation in the comprehensive plan is significant and it's tough to do it just by building this one space here or there. But, but if you look at like we can, if we flip the streets the way we're proposing, you can turn a street like Bow Street into a shared space use it differently. Um, we can use the landscape around the plaza far more effectively. A lot of that stuff is incorporated into the, the strategy and the costs of doing the, the public infrastructure upgrades that we've we, we've, we've seen necessary. Hue and Scale talks more about that, um, creating an elegant skyline. Um, one of the differences between um, what we did for zoning in 2009 and what the plan proposes, the 2009 zoning is very height focused. It's this is 100 feet, this is 135 feet, this is et cetera. And if you do a height focus thing and you try to sort of bulk out what you can do, you kind of end up with a group of buildings at one height and a group of buildings at another height and a group of buildings at another, or, or a long bar, like D2 would be a bar of 10 stories, like straight across the whole site. Um, what we tried to do in the neighborhood plan and we try to allocate to do through development is something that's actually a little more nuanced where basically you stay lower in certain points and pop certain things up higher. So what you end up with is sort of a, a, a pieces of skyline coming up with space in between rather than sort of building walls of buildings and sort of blocking views. So we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're focusing on how to do that. Um, make buildings of character. So everything about the buildings and the physical design tries to prioritize street and public space and blocks and kind of organizing in a, in a human scaled strategy. Um, connecting the neighborhood. Um, obviously fulfilling the promise of the Green Line expansion, extension, but even looks beyond that to the rail supporter, the urban ring, the Grand Junction line, and some of the other pieces going on over here. Um, focus on cycling and transit and bus access and trying to get all of those pieces together. Um, remarkable streets, talking about um, trying to keep speeds low, reducing collisions. Um, New York City and a lot of other places are looking about keeping speeds at 20 miles an hour for the goal of of, of reducing the potential for pedestrian deaths and collisions. Uh, pedestrians are far less likely to be killed in an accident at 20 miles an hour than at even 25 or 30. Um, so working towards that, um, encouraging street life, using infill development to create pedestrian experience. Um, so all of those pieces. And then um, mobility revolution. This has been a focus of a number of people in the neighborhood about, about looking at as we sort of shift to the world of everything from driverless cars to, uh, to park assist systems that can park more cars in less space and stuff to make sure that we don't sort of overbuild for an automobile economy and then the economy shifts and we're suddenly over, over designed for, for a certain strategy. This also talks about transportation demand management, something we're focused on with Assembly Square as well, where we try to make sure to uh, do everything we can to encourage people onto transit and, and walking and biking to reduce us to our 50% of travel trips, 50% or less we want to be driving trips in our new, new development districts in Somerville. So we're, we're focused on that and on making sure that that works as a part of this strategy. Um, and um, all of those ideas are, are pulled into there. There is a pretty robust TDM, transportation demand management strategy that's in our zoning overhaul draft and I imagine that would be carried forward to Union Square to make sure that it works um, if we do our parking ratios the way we've proposed. So, you know, one of the challenges of Union Square is there's a lot of activity at the Green Line Station. You see the core of the square, you see the Green Line Station. Um, 3,500 boardings a day at the Green Line Station, and, and it's exciting. And if you, if you really pull out to what you could do with the Grand Junction Line and connecting to Porter, you actually create a really interesting set of links that Union is right, is right in the middle of. So, so we are definitely at the core of, of, of a lot of transit activity, and, and, and we can really build on that for where we're going as we go forward and how and, and how we can, can can bring value to the community for for all of the opportunities that we want to do. We want to build on our strengths. You know, this is this is I like this because this this if you look carefully at this, the buildings on the right here are what we call the D seven block, where we're talking about development in the four story range. And if you actually look um, at the buildings, they're pretty much the same. If if we are successful with D seven and with someday putting the 
top two stories back on that building in the middle, we could actually rebuild Union Square back to its density that it was in this 1915 or so photo. Um, there are some key historic structures in the in the district. We do have a study ongoing studying those historic structures, looking at the potential of historic district solutions to address those particular issues um, and make sure we have a historic district around Bow Street in some areas, but covering the rest of what we find important and making sure that as we encourage development where we're encouraging it, we're, in fact, we're also encouraging preservation where, where we're supposed to. Um, the second piece, which is a key piece of our overhaul zoning strategy, um, is um, addressing the issue of maker spaces and art spaces. So if you look at, look at the colored yellow, red, orange here, um, these are the areas that we have designated as potential sites for fabrication type uses or fabrication zoning districts in the future. It includes the obvious, the Artisan's Asylum and Greentown Lab space. Um, it also includes the rest of the, um, the, the um, uh, Tube Works facility. Um, it also includes the little area uh, between Bow Street and Somerville Ave where those garages are all kind of tucked in the back. It includes Fringe. Um, Washington Art Center, there are a number of others here that we want to make sure that we don't incentivize redevelopment of this. What we, we discovered in the process of, the, um, of studying the fabrication district is that the fabrication district actually could create and sustain 3,000 jobs in the 28 acres that we would zone fabrication without even changing the buildings. Um, and those are important types of jobs and important places for having those jobs, so we want to make sure that that remains. Um, we looked a lot at the different attractions around the city and kind of what makes Union Square unique. And certainly the, the, you know, one of the fundamental strategies to the plan is addressing um, the issue of how you create development in a place that already is a place. It's not, you know, it's not some start from scratch greenfield. And there's already a community there and there's already a community has a real personality and soul and character. And, and you don't want to you, you don't want to lose that. So you know we, we have we have we have places we have we have um, you know we have street fairs we have we have protests we have all sorts of activity and a great place to do that. But actually, if you look, one thing's interesting. You kind of look at the core of the square where the cobblestones and stuff are. We still kind of struggle sometimes to have enough space to be able to do some of the community activity we do out there. And one of the strategies around it is to is to address that. Um, so looking at those 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 pieces, we're, we're, we're trying to leverage everything that's happening today, um, you know, from, from the Green Line to McGrath Highway, so here's, you know, McGrath Highway as it is today, McGrath Highway as a boulevard. Uh, one of the things McGrath Highway does that's interesting is it actually opens up land on each side of it. That land, in, in many spaces, could be green space, in some circumstances could be development sites. Um, yes? Sorry. the back Yes. That's the T parcels are basically Target and sort of the northeast corner. Um, that's the Grand Junction area. Yeah, it's 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 so yeah. We call these right here. So it's this this opportunity. So there's basically there's the core Union Square, which is pretty much the D's. The rest of it doesn't really have significant development. Um, most some of it may even be historic, where we don't want any development. There's Boynton Yards, which is down down here, which even that doesn't include like the little residential neighborhoods and stuff. It's really kind of the core of in here. And then there was this piece that's Target and, 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 and the, t the tow area, like, like this area in here. So we identified that as the T parcels. And if that's not clear in the plan, because we talk in this internal gobbledygook sometimes, and if we didn't, yeah, if we didn't clear, clarify it right somewhere else, we probably need to start at the beginning and do that. So those are the kind of things we catch as we, as we update the draft. So as you can see it here, here is, um, and, and, and here's kind of some of the key intersections and nodes that kind of keep all of this together. Um, we did a um, study of parking and kind of how many spaces we needed and how this works. This is a very aggressively sort of mixed mode share parking strategy and, and driving strategy, um, everything from, and these are strategies that, 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 that the park drive, that the traffic parking consultant did and sort of how we can use TDM strategies, transit access, um, captive market, like all these strategies sort of stacked on each other to try to reduce traffic needs and also reduce parking needs so that the, the less space we allocate to parking, the more we can allocate it to doing something else. Um, so looked at um, where residents and workers are. This is, this is existing in terms of um, driving 
percentages and kind of where, where that all goes and what we can do. Um, Boynton Yards, this is, uh, this is the existing kind of property ownership at Boynton Yards. So one of the things we looked at, originally we had we done a number of studies on Boynton Yards over the years where we actually just blew away all the property lines and, you know, actually in some cases all the buildings too and just sort of said, oh, we'll just wipe everything away and start from scratch and see how to use this land. Um, and most of it was early studies by traffic engineers saying you have to plow multiple streets through the site to make it work and they have to be straight ahead streets that you can go 40 miles an hour on. Well, we, we, we found that, you know, first of all, I think we were trying to study how to turn it into a suburban office park in the city and, and even the entities that create suburban office parks now are saying that offices want to be in mixed use walkable places. When you step back from that and you say, well, how can I use point yards and create viable, workable, um, workable street network and a workable development network, you can create something that is still to some extent a planning street grid, but it's a little bit more nuanced because basically it kind of just sticks out a bit. It keeps the Taza Chocolate building, which other engineers were anxious to just wipe off the plan so they can make the lines go straight. Um, but it creates a little zigzag here, and then down at the bottom, this is pretty much a straight through street. It has a little, you know, a little nut notch here. Um, what's nice about this particular design is that it, um, it, it, it with, with, with very few exceptions, and one significant one right about here, um, it, most of the potential development that could occur could occur on the existing property with the, at piece by piece if we wanted to do it that way or if it made more sense for the purpose of, of pulling everything together for the purpose of, of, um, of getting a, um, a, a land, you know, the infrastructure cost paid for and everything, it could be done as a master development strategy like the D blocks are. So um, it does create a problem down here because this street right now kind of comes this way. It, it crosses this commercial building and that green space. And it just, that just didn't work. I, we couldn't make that work. But for the most part, so this is like one way you could build out point and yards. And our, our, our folks are looking to do when they do the final version of plan to render like two or three other ways because this isn't meant to be like this is it. This lays out D3, which is one of the US2 development parcels. But amongst here, you can do uh, commercial residential mix with the green space in the middle. We had an early version where we tried to do a bigger green space here. It didn't really lend itself well to a commercial district. So uh, what we discovered is with the T um, now owning, or about to be owning the Walnut Street Center site here, and with Target's piece kind of going back here in an area that doesn't work well and you're butt right up against the, um, the residential neighborhood, this could be a really interesting recreational site and then you have a smaller green that's, uh, that's sized well for the commercial district. And this is where we put a group of the community gardens that exist today, because as you straighten the streets out, the little kind of corners they use today don't work. So it gives you a more significant site for community gardens. And it kind of makes, brings those pieces together in, in, a, in a way that can work. Um, for US 2's perspective, D3 is the most significant beacon sales, which could potentially be developed first as a commercial building, um, the Royal Wright Laundry site, which could be a commercial and residential building, and then a, uh, as you kind of enter into here, it kind of makes it interesting. This is the view you have today, um, and this is the kind of thing you could do with it, with uh, with that kind of shared street strategy and the zigzagging between and kind of make it really, I mean, in your, in your uh, you know, a couple hundred feet off the T station here. Um, and then you look at the core of the square, you have the redevelopment parcels, those are the ones that are colored, those are the D blocks. Um, and as you come back and kind of, you know, here's a, here's a nice little party in the new square, here's, here's the D7 block right here. Um, and um, this was a flag event in like 19, April 1917. Um, but what we've done, you know, really, I was actually, what, yesterday I was presenting to a group of architects, a large group that was not from around here, and I was trying to explain the Union Square street network to them. Um, and, and I was dizzy by the time I was done, you know, it's like, well, you know, so we've got this street that's one way and this street that's one way and this area is two ways, so if you're coming from here, you go like this, if you're coming from here, you go like that, and you go like this, if you want to go from Prospect up here, you zigzag and go this way, if you want to go from this way down that way, you zigzag that way, if you want to get this way, you've got to go around Bow Street, because Somerville Ave is one way this way, and it's like, okay, that's confusing enough, so... One of the most interesting things is if you turn Prospect and Webster into two-way streets, it reduces the traffic count on the block between them significantly because people no longer have to do this move or, 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 or especially going in, in the, 
westbound direction because if you're coming from Prospect and you're heading to Somerville Ave, you have to turn west and turn that way to go westbound. If you're trying coming from McGrath and you're heading to Cambridge, you have to go through that way to go westbound. And one of the things about this that just come out of a frustrating thing about this particular intersection and area is that Union Square is a very convenient way to get people from Medford to Cambridge, and yet we don't really benefit that much from that particular detail. So we need to figure out how to how to work to make the streets work the best for us. We're still going to get some of the through traffic, so we have to be ready for it, but we have to be able to make it all work together. What we that what this does is it rationalizes this into what is essentially a four-way intersection, albeit this is a little bit of an off angle from the four-way intersection. It picks up a significant amount of space over here. It turns Somerville Ave back into two-way here as well, which then makes Bow Street, particularly as you kind of come, as you look around Bow Street, the, the traffic flow on Bow Street drops to less than half of what it was before. Unless you're going to Walnut or Summer, there's no particular reason, or somewhere on Bow Street. There's no reason to be driving a car up Bow Street. So Bow Street can become more of a shared space, become become more valuable. This this whole piece of land can kind of be reclaimed as green. And within the core of the square, um, what we've done here is we've kept the parking here, but we've textured this all at one level. So you can imagine like you could kind of fill bollards in around the parking lot when you're using it as parking. And then when you wanted to open it up for an event, you just sort of drop a a, a barrier at the entrance to the parking lot and suddenly this becomes one plaza and it actually works like one plaza. There's not some curb you have to step up out of the parking lot to kind of get out of that one plaza. So Bow Street, there it is today. That's what it could be. That intersection, you can kind of see how it works. And it, if you take all of this pavement, basically it, a lot of that pavement goes away when you rearrange that street. And then the core, um, kind of looking at it a little more close up, you get this um, opportunity to uh, you know, it doesn't actually create much much more space than is there today, but it uses this in a way that this becomes the plaza. And then, with these work streets working two way, if you have a big event, you can, when you close this off, you can you can kind of come all the way across into here and and and, and make this really work. Um, the D6 site, which is the site today, with uh, uh, you got Dunkin' Donuts and you got the auto places here. This this becomes a um, um, the proposal so it says this becomes a commercial site. One of the um, and then. You know, so as you kind of look across this, you can you can you can kind of imagine the possibilities of how this all sort of works together. And um, I'll do that. This this is this is D1. The pink building could be could be office or could be a hotel or something. Um, could have all sorts of possibilities to it. This is sort of this is the public safety site with kind of residential and commercial. Um, we have talked about somewhere on this site making sure to also do a um, um, some sort of significant public civic activity. We've talked about the library, we've talked about relocating SCAT here, we've talked about a combination of the two, we've talked about any imaginable thing you can do to look at, but there's an opportunity here to really create a civic uh, presence here. Um, I, I, I don't want to forget that we and the US2 developer folks and everybody are still very cognizant of the fact that there is a certain flower market over here that we are determined to keep in Union Square, so we have not forgotten that. Um, this sort of looks down from from the station, um, and and then this this looks at the, the possibilities for the D2 site. Um, I want to I don't want to dwell on it here because it's not really a, 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 a I'll say this very briefly because I have an audience, but it's probably not relative to the whole issue of the community of the public benefits. Um, this drawing shows bigger buildings on this block of Allen Street back here. Um, it's something we presented to the owners of the, I think, 11 blocks, 11 lots that are back here. Um, I've heard, we've heard from a couple of them that they're not big fans of the idea. We're going to keep working on that question. That was something that we thought from a, from a um, sort of fr from an urban design perspective made some sense because it sort of stepped. Uh, the current zoning basically has this all at 10 stories. This, this has a building that's taller and then behind them you're basically at six or seven. If this was at like four or five before it goes to the neighborhood, it kind of could make sense. On the other hand, we're not we're not doing we're not doing eminent domain. We're not doing anything here at all, other than saying what do these neighbors here want their future to be? Um, and if they say they want their future to be exactly what it is, we can do that. We can sort of fence off the back of D two and do something creative and leave it as it is. Or we could look at that as a development site. If people back there want to develop, there were some contamination challenges and things years ago, so that question came up. But so I don't want to dwell on that, but that's one of the things we're getting a lot of comments on in the neighborhood plan, and we're continuing to hear those comments and figure out what to do about it. D2 
commercial, residential. So what, what this does at the core of the square, if you look at it, is it, um, it, it, it establishes, I, I don't have a good picture of it here, I don't think, um, but it establishes at the core a, a, um, a commercial center, which has been something I've heard from a lot of people for a long time is really important for Union Square. This building being commercial, this building being commercial, this complex being commercial, and basically puts a daytime population right in here around the retail and what's going on today. I uh, know there's going to be a forthcoming meeting about plans for the post office site. So it really keeps a lot of a, a lot of activity around the square, and then a lot of activity in Boynton Yards, and then from the the T sort of providing access to the pieces in between. Um, so. Comments on the document, SomervilleByDesign.com. The easiest way to find the document if you're looking for it online is go to SomervilleByDesign.com. When you get up to the front of the page, click the Union Square button and everything you need to look at the document is there. You can have a page where you can flip through it, you can download it, or you can use the open comment the thing to do it. If you're having trouble with the electronics, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to find a way to get you to flip through a paper copy as well. I know the strategy readers have paper copies now. You can. You can spend time with it. If you don't want to go through open comment or stuff, you can flip through it, make your comments, and then send us an email at planning at SomervilleMA.gov. That's the best way to reach us. Um, this is an attempt at a, um, this is what's on that back page right now, which is sort of a, a range of what the development capacity is. So we basically took kind of a middle point of what, what we think those buildings actually come up to be, but we know they're not exact. We went a little bit of a range on each side. Uh, we talked about the D parcel build out, the Boynton Yards build out, the T parcels that we just talked about in the total. Um, and then we use the midpoint of that as the basis for the fiscal impact report. So um, that's where we are today. That's what we're looking at today. And, and, and that's kind of what we, what we have as we go. Now, the fiscal impact report is done. Now, Amanda has copies of it. Um, we put it up on the website and uh, put it up in a couple of different places over the course of the last what, last past day. We got a copy of it in, I think, be beginning of this morning, basically. Um, it has taken a while, longer than I would have preferred, but it, it's, uh, it's here now. It has taken a while to get us to a point where we made sure that we had all of the inputs that our city staff and our finance team and everybody else um, has as accurate existing data for what it costs to run city government. And that's very important to get that in because then what a technical study from someone like Tishler Bice, this company does, is they look at, okay, well, what's it cost to run the parks department here and there? And then, okay, we're going to add 12 acres of new parks. How many more people do I need? How many more of this do I need? How many more of that do I need? Um, and then we also have to take some base numbers on what the, what the fiscal cost of the, um, of uh, what, what the fiscal benefit is that you get from taxes of the development. So some basic things to understand. This provides a 20-year build-out strategy. It basically outlines the idea of a build-out of the site over the course of 20 years. It, 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 it does it basically kind of plugging your way along through that build-out. Um, what is, if you look at that, then there's a, there's, there, there's a gross tax receipt. So there's a new amount of tax dollars that you get out of that in terms of residential property taxes, commercial property taxes, excise taxes, restaurant meal taxes, hotel room taxes, and those are all totaled up, and that's a, that's a great potential to look at all that great new value for the new city, but it is, for, for the city at this point, but it is discounted then by a certain amount of, of assumed costs. Um, one of those assumed costs is the cost of running city government for the extra services you have. Um, the extra teachers for the extra kids you get in the school, the extra parks employees for managing the parks that you have, the basic operating costs of city government that go up in these circumstances. Um, but the most significant thing on the other side of the balance sheet on, on, on this study um, is infrastructure costs. So we are making an assumption in this study that the entirety of the Union Square infrastructure improvements and the cost of it's at 70 or so million dollars, and the entire Point Yards infrastructure improvements, a cost of about $40 million, are, are, are bonded over the course of, of, of time and paid off while these um, uh, offset by the tax base. Now, one way you could do that is you could do this diff financing system as a way to offset that by the tax base. We, have, um, we haven't specified whether we're doing that or not, but even if you do a diff, it's coming out of that tax pool one way or the other. Um, it's just it's financed differently and it may be more affordable and more manageable to do. But either way, we've established this, this number 
as the basis of the of the of the um, uh, of the of the work. Now that includes the subsurface work and the surface work. Some folks have pointed out that the subsurface work, the 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 the, the drainage infrastructure work in Union Square, we might have to do that whether we whether we build something or not. But we decided to take a conservative approach and include it in the negative side of the fiscal impact. So imagine the possibility that if we did no development at all, we still may need to spend some 30 of that $70 million just fixing that drainage work. But we put it in the fiscal impact study. Now, the rest of that is the above ground work, which includes the streetscape work that we've shown in the plan. So there's an assumption as you look at this, the streetscape work is, is, is in this cost. On Boynton Yards, the 40 million to do all of that work, to do the new streets, to do all of those pieces, our expectation is um, that that would be done over over the course of time as Boynton Yards is, is, is being developed by the entities that end up doing it, whether it be a master developer or individual landowners. Um, it's important to, to say that, again, we sort of made a conservative assumption there. We assumed that that cost was coming out of tax dollars. Um, there may be the opportunity to say to the developers doing work over there, well, we expect that you know some opportunity would come for you to pay for that. But that said, if it comes out of the developer side, it may open up more tax dollars, but it, it's kind of, you have that pool for benefit type stuff and infrastructure stuff developers can do, and you have the pool for stuff that can come out of tax dollars. But the essence of this is, you know, so as you look at all of this, so we, this study is dependent upon making assumptions on all of these numbers, on making decision points. Uh, I don't believe there's a firm in the country that's better at this than Tischler Bites, and I feel very confident also in our own finance staff's ability to work with them to, to establish the baseline. So we've done our work to do that. Um, and we've established the basics of, of, of what this means, key development assumptions, residential units, affordable units. Um, so you can see this is the Union Square side, um, kind of what the, what the assessed value is of those units, the number of jobs, the retail, the creative enterprise office, hotel rooms. Um, and this is on page two. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on page two, thank you. Um, and, and, and I'll say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm I, I, I've had about a day, a day to look at this too, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you all learning it. And then as we go through and into the January meeting, we will we can learn from it. We can ask questions. Carson of Carson Bice, who's the one who wrote this report, will be at the January meeting. So if you have questions of him, or we want to, you know, see what happens if we change an assumption, or how, you know, what happens if we shift the way we address something, or if we uh, create a diff program for something, or if we create some other program for something, you know, what, what can we do on the tax dollar side here? Um, so I'm looking at development assumptions, Union Square development assumptions, point and yards. So you can look at some of the basic numbers in terms of revenues. Um, you could look at some of the, the some of the cumulative impacts. So basically, uh, this is a 20 year total. So basically you're totaling up over the course of 20 years. Um, this is page three at the bottom. Yep, page three at the bottom. So um, total general fund revenue in Union Square is over $200 million, and Boynton Yards is over $270 million. Special revenue is, is, is some, some of those categories that aren't in general fund. Um, and then you look at general fund operating expenses, so there's 60 million and 45 million for the two, 60 in Union and 45 in Boynton. So that's the cost of running the city government. Uh, public school operating expenditures, four million in Union and seven million in Boynton. So that's the additional cost of kids in the school system and teachers and all of the pieces that go with that. And then the bottom, you see capital cost expenses. So Union Square, there's 91 million and Boynton Yards is 50 million, and that's the cost of doing the work plus interest on the bonds for for those particular activities. So then you see an expenditure number, which is the total of those expenditures. And so there's a net cumulative fiscal impact. In Union Square, it's 44 million over 20 years. In Boynton Yards, it's 168 million over 20 years. Um, the average means, on average, we would add, if you just add the two together, um, about $10 million on average per year of new tax dollars to the city of Somerville by doing this building. Just stop right there. That is a bottom line. I mean, that number is a make on At the bottom of page three, Data yes. Stop at this point. And over 20 years on average, you're looking at over $10 million per year net fiscal benefits. That's serious money. That's after paying off the infrastructure. I'll tell you, my biggest, when I heard this last week on the phone, I was so relieved because I was really nervous. 
that there wouldn't be money to pay for the infrastructure, much less the community benefits. So this is one of those delightful situations where whether you like it many or not, this is the market giving you uh, available resources to do some things that you want to do as a community. So it's a and, and, and that's when you say after paying off, is that after the paying off is done or that's year by year? That's year by year. Year, 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 year by year. Year by year. It's not paying them off. And year by year. your balance is at full development, which is also so now this is the average of 20 years with development ramping up. So here's the here's here's the interesting takeaway. The average is 10, and and, and notice that it actually is, it is it's actually for union it's a little negative for a couple of years because the bonds aren't covered by the cost of development um, in 2018, 2019, 2020. Uh, it turns around very quickly at that point. And this is page four. Right. So now if you get to that last year, 2035. So now you're 20 years out. Right. In year 20. And that's in thousands. So basically, you're at you're at five million and, and, and seventeen million. So at year twenty, what you're actually generating is something closer to twenty three million. Which means, well, your average over the twenty years is ten. Year twenty is twenty three million. Year twenty one is twenty three million. Year twenty two is twenty three million. That's the that's that's what's there for you over the long run. So that's that's the money that's there beyond that. Carson does 20 years of build out, does 20 years of, of ramping, and then he leaves it. But the reality is, once that's done, that money is is that money is there for you year after year, and that's so. Now I got to. It's all going into old people's funds when we get tired. <laughs> <laughs> so well, so so I mean that that's that's part of the question. I hear a lot of people always say, well, the schools don't have enough resources to do the things we want them to do. That allows you to do some of that, um, but it also allows you to see what other things could be important to do with that. So I'll just keep taking questions. Go ahead. I'm very impressed with you. Thank you. Yeah. Those are the same costs. You can do the That's my understanding, yeah. The second question is, could they do a projection of what the impact of the income would be for the other side? Yes. Could they do a projection of what the impact would be for the other side? Yes. Could they do a projection of what the impact would be for the other could we do the impact of a real estate transfer tax at 1%? We would have to do an assumption on how much real estate changes hands in order to do that. So in other words, it would be another set of assumptions. Okay. I'm not sure I have it in Carson's um, scope to do that, but with the data we have, we could give it a try and see what sort of data we come up with. Well, the reason I say that is that, is that we know how much real estate has been sold in the last 15 years, 16 years, and to just project more real estate at roughly the same prices, which is not likely, but frankly, that's conservative. That would give us some really strong numbers, because they're huge numbers. The point is a 1% transfer is a very large amount of money. So I understand, for those who haven't been following what Joe's talking about, the, the Sustainable Neighborhoods Committee has talked about establishing a real estate transfer tax in certain circumstances that could be attributed towards addressing housing needs in the city, um, and that, that we could we could do some more study on what that would mean. Yes. Um, and and, and, and I, I, I can't tell you right now I got the resources to do that, but I will try. So, okay. thank you. All right. And then have you, I, I don't know how to ask this, but have we thought about, or have you thought about, um, other kinds of things you can ask of development or property managers? So as you, I'm just using Cambridge as an example. So if you are going to be adding jobs to this area and a lot more people coming in, then you need to mitigate those trends. So you can either pay money to do that or you can offer benefits to your employees to get them to not drive alone there. So that money is another pot that you could then use for community benefit. And I, I don't know if that's part of this analysis. It, it, it's not, so it's not, the, step out of the fiscal for a second and look back at the neighborhood plan. The strategies are in the neighborhood plan to look at that. One of the things we need to do post neighborhood plan is, is draft a zoning strategy that works for this. Um, it has been Somerville's strategy in general and, and I will, and I've been a big fan of this in working with it to try to be as specific and um, as, as um, uh, detailed as I can be in the zoning of what our expectations are of developers. It's good for the community, it's good for developers, so everybody knows up front what the expectations are. So if that becomes an expectation, we can build that into a system of how we do transportation demand management. Um, in general, 
the one thing I am not going to be 100% specific on is over the course of a neighborhood plan being built out over, over the course of decades, um, sometimes specific locations of specific buildings change. So I know we said, okay, you know, this goes here and that goes there. You know, you could put a hotel on this corner and, and of D1 and commercial on D6. Well, if the hotel's on D6 and the commercial on D1, I don't want to hold them to that. But because that there may be logic to that changing, but overall the 60-40, you know, getting at least 60% of commercial, getting a certain percentage of affordable housing, making sure that we have a certain percentage of it that's, that's good for families, making sure that we address issues about how we do transportation demand management, um, addressing kind of how they how they deal with the public realm. Um, we have. We have the inclusionary housing, we have linkage, we have the jobs linkage idea that has been floating in the legislature that needs legislative approval, which would be linkage for job training for neighborhood residents to be able to get jobs in the commercial spaces that are there. All of these things are kind of floating in the, the zoning side of the strategy, and some of them provide public benefits on their own. Respond to that. I think we need a comprehensive list of what those are, because if we're supposed to make a clear strategy for how to pay for this stuff that we're suggesting that we need to know what is out there and what is possible. Right, and so what I think you're saying, Jennifer, is that embedded in the strategy are things such as 20% affordable housing, which is higher than, I believe, any city. Well, it's higher than our city. Right, okay. Anyway, it's a chunk of affordable housing units. So we need to go through here and make sure that we have the community benefits that are baked into the neighborhood plan already. Yeah. So that the strategy that you're considering doesn't bake them in again if you don't want them, because they already may be in there. Or you may want to double, or whatever you want to do. But, but we need to work with you, Victoria, perhaps, if, if we can go through with a fine tooth comb the neighborhood plan to see what community benefits are already in there. One of the things I will say is, is I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this discussion about benefits is there's really there's 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 two significant opportunities when you have development and you want to address benefits and and I think you know we, we've been we've been talking folks asked me about this and I'm sure they ask Chris and others about this nationally a lot now like how do you how do you move forward in creating great places and address issues of equity and displacement and, and, and small business and all of the other challenges we're addressing. And there's there's opportunity to look at the tax benefit and kind of what you can do with, with what the public sector side should be doing with the tax benefit. And then there's opportunity to look at what the private sector side can contribute in the form of, of, of assistance to the community beyond the basics of, okay, I'm gonna build a residential building or I'm gonna build a commercial building. So. And, you know, we start with the idea that right now in Somerville, if someone builds a commercial building, we say, well, we want you to donate a little bit towards affordable housing. We base the number right into the zoning ordinance so everybody knows what it is. Or if you do a residential building, we expect you to do a percentage of affordable housing of 50% of 80% of median income typically on site. We bake those numbers right into the zoning ordinance. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting to me to see, um, and, and, and the key to some extent with the private development community is, is baking in enough community benefits to be able to generate as much as, as, as much value you can for the things that are important to you without baking in so many community benefits that you don't get the development because you've stepped beyond what allows a developer to get that reasonable enough return to make it possible for them to, 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 to cause their investors to not go, oh, well, I'd rather just leave my money in a savings account. You know, that there has to be enough of a value for it to say this is worth investing in. So you've got to work that the best way you possibly can. And, and, and make make that happen in, in, a, in a way that makes sense. I do like, though, the idea that as much as we can, the strategy we establish for public benefits around Union Square, it can work for US too. Um, it can work for anybody else that may walk in our door wanting to do stuff here too. So we're not going back and doing this over again. So I'm, 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 what can go in zoning can go in zoning. What can go in um, a public benefits screen arrangement where we'll work with um, whatever this entity is can go working with this public benefits entity what what goes into our tax decisions to say okay next year we're going to use some of this tax money to fund X Y and Z can fund X Y and Z because that's what we've all decided is important to us to do did you want to add to that the other question just sort of base question is of course the big controversy over the green line cost overruns how has that been factored in or has it not been factored in? 
So it, it's, it's not factored into either our side or the developer's piece at this point. We do need to be sensitive to the fact that one of the things that the Green Line is requesting of us is that there be some sort of value sharing is the best way I would describe it, of the cost of, you know, a lot of the benefits of the Green Line come to Somerville, so Somerville and its development community should try to provide some of some of the cost to the, towards the Green Line. So US2 and, and the Green Line folks have been talking about the possibility of that. We and the Green Line folks have been talking about the possibility of that. I want to be sensitive that I, I, I can't, I, you know, if that happens, I have to acknowledge that that exists and that that has to come out of somewhere in this in this pool. Um, and the only way to grow the pool is to grow more development. And and and, and if, if everybody comes to the conclusion that we have to do that, I'm not going to necessarily completely say no. But I've got to reopen the neighborhood plan to do that, and that's pretty tricky. So that's we've got to be very careful if we make that decision what we're doing. So. So so. Because you can also do trades with the with with, with the developer regarding regarding that, that transfer tax <coughs> asset. I mean, it gives you a lot more flexibility. It, if you look at the models in, 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 in Pennsylvania, for example, or in Seattle, or in or in or in Chicago, where the transfer tax is substantial, much more than we're talking about, uh, it would be it, it gives it, it gives exactly that kind of liquidity to the relationship. The question, that, one of the questions I'd like to raise, though is that you talk, we in talking about public, uh, public uh, community benefits, we're actually talking about community incentives. And one of the things that's interesting is, is that there are, the, these community incentives are not just financial, as you point out. And the more we can be more specific about how and who pays for those and who gets the reason, they're really community investments. And as we begin to talk about those kinds of community investments, we can see we, we can look for return on those investments. Part of the difficulty is community benefits sound like it's one direction, when in fact it's multiple directions. It comes in and it also improves the quality of life as well as the mobility of the individuals. So that if we can show that mobility, that, that, that investment return, we, we're doing much better and much stronger. My concern about this specifically is that the lobbying with the legislature regarding regarding the transfer tax will involve those numbers, because those are the numbers that Cambridge and Boston and other cities in Massachusetts want to look for from some of them. I hear you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm also glad that this analysis has been done, and it's great that uh, we're not going to bankrupt the city. I think that's an excellent thing. There's another economic analysis, though, that needs to be done that I don't see present in here at all. As we all know, since about 1975, we've been living in a country where wealth has been redistributed, where income inequality has been growing, and it's reached a crisis proportion. This is a national conversation that we're not immune to here. I think we need to have another economic analysis in here that says, does what we're proposing reduce income inequality for the residents of the city or exacerbate it? Now, we may not know how to do that right now, but I'll bet you there's people who do. I don't think I, I can even begin to answer that question. I, I'm not asking you to answer it, George. I think we need to do it, though, as part of this process, because otherwise we're not doing a responsible process. Yes, what I'm saying is I, I, I don't think I can do that study until you all develop what the benefits are, because the goal of the benefits would be to address those issues. And if I did it without addressing those issues, I would tell you it doesn't. Not, not entirely. I'll give you an example. If, for example, we have a strategy that brings in jobs that pay low wages, then we're probably going to be exacerbating income inequality. That has nothing to do with community benefits. That, that has to do with the kind of jobs that we choose to draw in in, in our strategy. If we make a different choice, a different outcome. So I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. So this is a possible strategy that you might want to consider over the next two months. That there's fiscal impact, there is economic impact uh, at the GDP level uh, and, and at the job level, but there may be a social equity economic impact and this might be a this might be a, a Gini coefficient analysis that could be part of the strategy. 
And so we, I mean, we need metrics. We've got real estate economic metrics. We have social equity metrics that we have baked into this. But maybe we need a Gini coefficient, which is what most people would, you know, it's kind of done. I, before we talk about how we're going to spend the money, I, uh, what verification do we have that these are good numbers? Uh, is this based on, on the economy continuing the way it is, or are we going to suffer the ups and downs that typically happen every seven years or so? I, I think, so we, realistically, we, you know, I mean, I think all of us, including myself, are going to have some questions about this report as we look at it over the course of the next couple couple months. And, and while I have the schedule on the neighborhood plan comment period, I'm probably going to open a comment period on this report that goes longer since it arrived at this point in time, and, and, and it deserves some feedback. Um, there are some things that are complicated in the world that this report I, I, I establishes in a way that we have to determine what to do about those complications. So it anticipates growth over 20 years. Well, growth doesn't happen straight line. Growth happens in real estate cycles. So the actual growth may be, the next three years may be great growth, and then there may be five years of slow growth, and then there may be seven years of great growth. And, and if that's what happens, um, as long as at the end we get to the end, the averages will average out and if the line may not look exactly like this, it may have a little dip here and a little rise here, and, and, but it's tough to sit here and predict the real estate cycles to get those pieces. Um, but I think Wig has said he believes this is a three real estate cycle project or a four real estate cycle project, and I think that that's a fair assessment to say that this is not something that grows over the course of kind of it plots along and grows. It's, it's we're good and then we've got a tough time. But I mean, one of the nice things about a project that has multiple uses in it is, you know, if one, if, if the, if one piece of the market picks up, the other piece doesn't go one way or the other way. There was a time about eight years ago where everyone in the world wanted to build a hotel. And then there was a time five years ago where no one in the world wanted to build a hotel. And now we're back in the business where everybody wants to build a hotel. So if we wanted to have one hotel, now's a good time to do it. You know, five years from now may not be, 10 years from now might be, so it's, it's I don't think cars are going to immediately predict that, but it's, so it's a little simpler than that, but it's it's designed to understand that that's going to happen. I mean, right now we're at the peak of a market, and if history repeats itself as it usually does, we're going to drop. Uh, are these units going to come online or at the bottom of the market, and are we going to be waiting five to 10 years before any revenue comes in? I, I, it, so, so, sure. Could, very, Chris said very possible. I think all those things are, are within the realm of possibility. I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at the national real estate models and sort of where the money is and where the finance is for development, these things happen in the cycles. If you look at regionally where we stand in terms of our housing needs, especially housing needs within walkable areas like Union Square, we have whether the peaks and valleys better than other places have recently. And I, I don't know what Chris feels, I feel like, um, I've, I've been doing research on this for many, many years, and, and the pent up demand for walkable urban development structurally is probably a 20, 30 year run. But having said that, we in real estate can overbuild any market no matter how good it is, and we're going to go through. Real estate has the most boom bust cycle in any business by far. And going to the Urban Land Institute annual meeting a month ago in San Francisco, the most common phrase was, we're in the seventh inning. We're in the seventh inning of this cycle. So just recognize that you don't control mother nature, you don't control mother market. And we're, you know, when we go down, we don't just go down a little in real estate, we crash and burn. So um, just keep that in mind. So uh, I'm going to go, Scott. Joe, I'm going to get back to you. I just, just want to kind of work around people who haven't spoken yet. Well, people don't get a chance. So, so I realize all of us haven't actually got to look at the plan, you know, the fiscal plan, including to an extent yourself, you know. Um, so absolutely, there are busts and booms and cycles and so forth. So I guess between now and whenever we get more information, it would be really helpful also to get a better understanding of the assumption behind assumptions behind the assumptions you know, on issuance of rates. Um, in particular, valuation, what, what, you, what is the, let's say, 1,500 units, whatever it is, of housing valued at with some sort of inflation factor? I mean, that would help us, because then we understand, are we talking about relying on $700,000 condo sales or $450,000 condo sales? 
condo sales? Are we talking about $3,000 rents or $2,000 rents? And these things are more, I think, germane and more important to, to us. In the commercial arena, which I know is important to a lot of us, um, you can see the assumptions yeah. on page two and three. Right. So they're basic they're assumptions. Mm -hmm. quickly, given you want to go over that? I can't. I mean, what it says up there is $190,000 a unit for residential units and $340 a square foot for retail and office and $200 a square foot for the space that's creative enterprise. That's your, let me just ask though, that's your assessed that's value. Assessed value, yes. Is, well, there's a relationship, but often they can be. They're, they're, they're off a little bit by timing, usually. I mean, you're supposed to. <coughs> so they're, you're saying they're conservative by nature, but that isn't necessary. That is market value, which is another question. Right, that's. 190,000. That, you're not going to build lunch at 190,000. Yeah. My understanding of, of, of Massachusetts real estate assessments is they're supposed to assess 100% of market. Um, in reality, it, 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 it's a little off in how it works that way because you're lagging the actual market. At least a year and a half behind. So it's, it's a little weird, but, but I do think it is, a, it, 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 it is a conservative but in the ballpark estimate so that if values do go down, it still does hold. Um, the issue is you do have to offset and ask the question of what happens as um, um, if the growth, you have to look at the growth versus the um, versus the bond payments and kind of make sure right. that there's, there's assumptions that are important there and then commercial Leasing rates, are we talking 20 bucks a square foot, 40? So, I, 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 like 20 to 40 bucks a square foot, depending on yeah. retail. So, yeah, because long story, long story short, because I know we're going to be charged with doing like a one to four or two to five year type strategy, um, what often can happen, I'm not trying to put a damper, but is, is that you, know, you get X built and then you hit one of these troughs or rates change or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, it leads to good place management, but but really, it leads to questions of what gets built first and who's going to do it and whether we're comfortable with that. Because you can sometimes be left with just oh, that. Okay, I'm going to make sure everybody gets a chance. I'm going to go to Derek next. Um, first, I'm just going to decide to go back a little bit to sharing the value with the, the T. I'd love to also share with them the additional traffic we've had, all the pollution and everything else from the big day that's compelled them to come. And if they'd like to give us back a few of the years we've been waiting, we can share that too. That's it. That's just the reminding them also that the state revenue out of this development is pretty significant, you know, in terms of income taxes and stuff. Pretty I thought Joe was the smartest. It just, uh, <laughs> it just, I could, wow, see that handout? I just, wow. Anyway, uh, regarding this number, um, one of the things in just kind of ballpark units, you know, I'm seeing it's kind of about a 5% ROI if, you, if it works out. And I don't know if that, Chris, can you tell, is that something that cities look at in terms of what's the expected return on an investment? Uh, because the, the one line we don't have is the risk. And if we're signing the bonds for all of this, of our part of the investment up front, we've got a huge risk that goes down precipitously. I don't know if that can be managed, because that's, that's how we need to make this decision. Right. And, and I don't know what's a reasonable expectation for, hey, if we had just you know, put this in our piggy bank, we'd expect to have $140 million over this time period instead of 220, but it's a sure thing. And, and you, as a city, are going to have to, have to make bets just as the developers are making bets. And your bets have to be made on the infrastructure up front before the developer can move forward. Having said that, the developer is risking a whole lot more money in aggregate than what the city is. But the city money does come up front. And so you're in partnership with these developers. And so you know, you're, you're both in bed together and you're going to be at risk. Well, they're just at a five-year risk and we're in a 20-year risk. And that's what, you know, so it's just, it just we're trying to understand how that could be mitigated. I just I, don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to talk about that as we go. I do think it's worth noting that uh, one of the things that I just personally think is very conservative about this study is that I think that there's at least $30 million in the infrastructure on the Union Square side that we're going to have to do even if we do no development. That we're going to be having to pay for out of city taxes and sore fees if we don't have another source to do it. So that is a piece to consider, but we'll study these pieces more as we go. Yeah. Or you can raise property taxes. Well, in Massachusetts, sometimes we can't, so that's another stuff. Uh, <laughs> Patrick. Yeah. Um, George, just you know, related, you, you did already cite the fact that some of that infrastructure would need to be upgraded anyway. Yeah. Uh, it seems that the public safety buildings, in particular the cost of $20 million for the fire station, 
at least some of that would have to be addressed anyway. I just, if you had any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this assumes, assumes in this that we are building a new fire station somewhere. We are in the midst of a study to determine if, when, where, how fire stations would best work for the city. Um, you know, and it may be likely that that study would say a public safety center in the middle of Union Square doesn't make any sense again, even if we didn't do this development. Um, so we took the conservative approach to include the fire station cost in here um, and, and, and address that idea. But again, yeah, it could, it, 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 it could be that certain ones of these um, could be things, and that could be one of them, that we'd have to spend that sort of money anyway. Um, I want to address two things before the next question. Um, the first is an inconsistency in between the fiscal impact analysis and the neighborhood plan. Um, the infrastructure costs for Boynton Yards are included in the fiscal analysis and in the neighborhood plan we talk about having the developers build the in infrastructure and that's all in the name of being conservative. Um, and planning for up front. Um, so that's something that might change um, in the fiscal impact analysis over the feedback period. Uh, the next um, is that we decided to um, be really conservative in this analysis because that's what's really important. I know when we're all planning our personal finances, it's better to have money in the bank at the end than realize you're a few dollars short. So um, that's why there's that inconsistency. Yeah, so I, I, I would add, you know, we have to study and figure out how to best pay for the point in the yard side of the infrastructure. If, you pay, if the developers paid for it, that could work great, but it may limit the amount of public benefits that could come out of the developer side, but it may put more tax dollars and less risk on our side, so it's a matter of balance and all that. Well, don't just go around and do the three of, three of you in order if you want to go. Uh, three quick, quick comments. First, uh, Regina Bertoldo is here, so I hope she'll get a chance to introduce herself. Yes, yes, you will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Switch your name cards. Oh, okay. So, so I'll do that. that. Calls you Regina in the next <laughs> I take it as a compliment. Um, and then the next um, one issue I thought about in reading the plan was that uh, it seems like um, if I did the math right, that Union Square is now absorbing 30% of the um, new jobs that were that were set as targets in summer vision, and 42% of the housing that was set in summer vision. But it's something like between about 5% or maybe up to 9% of the open space. So it's a it's a and I understand that that's probably because the interbelt we're, we're taking on some of the the development that would have happened in the interbelt, but that because that's delayed, that couldn't happen. So. I guess the question is, or maybe we'll figure out through this process, could you use the expected revenue to um, create a, a fund to purchase open space surrounding Union Square? So even if you couldn't change the amount of open space right in the, in the, in the development parcels, you could figure out a way to um, help ease some of the, the need in the surrounding areas for open space or for even like tra traffic mitigation, um, because it does seem like we otherwise, our neighborhood will take on a kind of a, a disproportionate burden of the city's needs. Um, and then a, a related question at some point, I would love to see what, what's going to happen in the inner belt then, I mean, be, because it changed, the whole kind of equation has been changed slightly in terms of the summer vision goals. Um, and then a final thought is that in the sustainable neighborhoods process, we had looked at the possibility of creating a DIF that would um, build a, a district, district improvement financing process that would build affordable housing, but the group had kind of dismissed it because they thought the infrastructure costs would be too great to add in. Uh, affordable housing um, investment, and so this that changes the equation and kind of seems like it raises that possibility again. So a couple of quick thoughts, and first of all, on the, yeah, I, mean, I think on the open space side, that's something definitely to consider and see how to address it. We do have a neighborhood plan for Interbelt, and it, it's a great plan. The challenge is the infrastructure to implement it versus the ability to do immediate build out is more complicated than it is at Boynton Yards, which is why we've been focusing our energy sort of here first. And if you look at Summer Vision's next 15 year time frame, I think that over the course of 50 years, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through to those places. But um, Boynton Yards and then Brick Bottom are a little bit more accessible, and then the Interbell, especially south of the tubes, is, is the later challenge, and we just need to work our way through each of those. Um, it, DIF for affordable housing is an interesting idea. It's, it's, it's one that I wouldn't necessarily want to say should be on or should be off the table. My only caution is that in the very early years on the Union Square side, there, 
the bond costs do exceed the tax revenues, but it's, it's for a short period of time. So if it's something you looked at implementing as things started to pick up, it might, it might make sense. It might not work immediately. It might work five years from now, just because of the way that graph is shaped. Ben. So I kind of wanted to go back to what um, David Gibbs was saying. I, and obviously, you've done a lot more work on, and homework in understanding this than I have. But I don't understand how we can produce this and make a bunch of assumptions based on a neighborhood plan, but yet we can't create some sort of impact study on, on the social equity side based on the same plan. So I'm just a little lost because you're saying it would have to come out after we've done all this, whereas I'm saying you've already created a plan, you've made assumptions based on the plan to come up with a fiscal, how come we can't do the same knowing you know, making a lot of the same assumptions. And the answer is, is that it's never been done before. And love to try to do it here. But to my knowledge, we don't have the technology for a social impact analysis. Again, what, what we did, what, what GW and the Bar Foundation did in looking at, which I'm gonna share with you right after dinner, um, about the, you know, it, the, the social equity performance metrics that we applied to Metropolitan mm -hmm. Boston, it's never been done before. And so now we have a measurement, so now let's use the measure. So, so it, it, it's a very, very rational and a aspirational question. Maybe we can find a way to do it. But yet in your study of walkability of DC, you do come out with in your conclusions, a lot of areas of, uh, that have to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. affordable housing and other things. And we did the same thing here in Boston. Yeah, and so um, we, have, we have metrics for, uh, for Union Square, and we have metrics for Harvard Square, and we have metrics for the financial district. The financial district does very well economically, and it's miserable as far as social equity, as you would expect. Here we're doing pretty well. Both are moderately doing reasonably well as far as both economics and... Is there a way to get that study? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'd love to see it. it. Yeah. Okay. Still, the day's young. Okay. I'll <laughs> <laughs> and then Eric, and then Benny. Okay. I, I've got a couple things on the fiscal, and then I want to go back to the plan, too. Sure. Um, one, one note that's kind of apart, though. Melissa, can you keep uh, uh, notes online about like what you just said about the disconnect between the plan and the fiscal, so that people could see that? And, you know, just some simple list of of um, it's not really errata, but just you know tips or whatever. Um, with regard to the fiscal, a um, couple things. First, you know the the starting. Uh, costs and revenues are almost irrelevant in a 30-year project. I mean, th these district transformations all take longer than predicted. Every single one of them takes longer than predicted. And the price today for one kind of building or another, that makes sense to people who are used to doing single buildings. It doesn't make any sense um, for people who are doing districts. So just, just for people to keep in mind that those things are going to go up and down, not even in sync. Uh, some of the things will be in sync, but others will be completely out of sync. Um, I do think it's worth somebody talking about sensitivity. Maybe Carson can talk about it, or, or maybe you're going to talk about it a little bit later. I, I think the sensitivity on the infrastructure is not so much time risk, but cost risk. We have a lot of cost overruns in infrastructure. And as you said, once you commit to the infrastructure, then you pretty much got to finish it. And um, there's lots of examples. The Green Line is just one example, but there's an awful lot of them, especially in, in this region and in this state. Uh, the second thing is that there's a lot of risk to the timing of the commercial development. Um, it can get stretched out quite easily, and, and I think it's actually natural for that to happen. Um, each cycle kind of bumps the timing out, and you usually don't catch up. Um, and you can look at the areas like South Boston, where they were about 25% done after 30 years. So, I mean, that's a much bigger redevelopment than here, but still, it, it certainly has taken much longer than people expected. This is a, a low growth area of the country. We don't have a lot of population growth relative to the rest of the country. 
A um, couple other things on that. Um, it would be interesting to understand the segment sensitivities. Maybe that's in here. I don't know if it is or not, but uh, clear, clearly there's some uh, land uses that are going to be net positive almost from the get-go. There are other land uses that are going to be net, net negative or neutral. And I think it's important for people to understand those. Um, and, and you know, many of the land uses people are going to want just because of their value to the community nothing to do with profit or loss, but if you're doing a fiscal impact report, it's important to understand housing versus retail versus upper story employment on, on cost expenses and revenues. Um, let's see. Um, with regard to the, the comment on open space, I, I think it's a really important comment and a good example of that is East Somerville and Cambridge, where they pretty much drive the economic benefits of the city of Cambridge and they come up way short on open space. So there's a, a really good example there of that. Um, then uh, going, uh, well, one other sensitivity you might look at is children. You know, a lot of people look at like the first five years of Avalon Bay or other similar uh, multifamily developments and they tend to have very few children in the first five years, but those some, same people, the same couples, when they want to stay in the community, they tend to have a normal amount of children later. Um, you know, whether they can stay in those same housing units or not. And Brick Bottom's a pretty good example of that. We, you know, we heard a lot of testimony when it was being proposed that there wouldn't be any children from the artists who were going to live there. And lo and behold, 30 years later, there's more children than original artists, and almost all of them had to move out. But they had children. Um, and, and that's not a bad thing, right? We want people to live here long term. Um, now I want to switch to the plan a little bit, if it's OK. So a couple of us had a hard time downloading and printing it. Is that now fixed? You can download it. You can open comment it. You can issue it, which is an online viewer. Nope. You can absolutely be able to get it. So let me know if you can. But what about print? So if you want to print it, you push the download button, walk away for a few minutes, it should download. If, if A few minutes. Uh, um, with City Hall's slow Wi-Fi this morning, it took me about five minutes to download it. So I understand. It's not like instant, but just be patient. If you want to flip through it on the screen, the issue program, which we recently added to the website, lets you push a button and sort of slide through the pages. And I think that's a lot easier than it was, was before. Um, and, and I understand the way that we created the graphics made it larger than I would have otherwise liked. I'm determined to make it accessible to anyone who needs it, though. We have paper copies now. If you want to come to the office. You can't print it. You can't print it after you download it? No. Well, I'm asking. I, I haven't been able to, and Philip Parsons wasn't able to. It depends on your printer, Wig. The, the okay. cache memory, all that stuff. In terms all right. Of the process, the okay, I, I got half of it printed and it just stopped and I couldn't get past yeah. it. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I, so. I, you have a printout now. If I, I do. Thanks, Melissa. I really series, appreciate it. I will work to get. At the table here, also received hard copy today. Okay. Oh, okay, so I got a couple more things on the plan. I'm sorry. Um, uh, um, so. I'm concerned about the time allowed for comments, to be frank. I, I, do, how, many, how many individuals have made comments online? I have not counted. I have been monitoring. I mean, we got 80,000 people in the city. My guess is that you have a tiny percent of people having made comments. Uh, it, it took the staff and, and the hired consultants six months to produce the plan. You're funded, you're working in nine to five hours, and, and working people, a lot more than nine to okay. five hours. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's good, I appreciate that. I mean, not long term, it's not good, but okay, you're, you're, you're working 18 hours a day. Um, that, I think, helps my point. Um, so I, I think given the interaction of the plan and this locus process, it would be extremely helpful to leave the plan comment period open until mid-January. Mid I, 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 I hear you, I acknowledge that. I, I can't make a promise on that standing right here, but I will say I, I hear your comment. Okay, well we would like to be able to make that public announcement within a couple days, uh, and, so. And could you, George, say why? Uh, I mean, you need to under, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of moving market, right. and you know, it's not a free thing to just postpone it. It, that there are costs, and George should tell you. Yeah, so, so, I mean, I 
I mean, there, there, there's, there's two. One is sort of um, how, how our consultant time is allocated. Um, the other is, 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 is honestly a technical strategy of how the steps coming out of the plan to do zoning, to get pieces done. We've had two goals from the beginning. One is to start the development work with the T station. The other is to start the development work before this seventh inning real estate cycle disappears. And it looks like that based upon the plan, it needs some zoning changes in order to be able to be doable. And I don't want to implement the zoning change process on a plan that's not finished. So, I'm, so that's what I'm sensitive on. And if you break out the, the, the timing necessary to do that, it creates some challenges after about the beginning of February. So. I, I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I'm also sensitive to the fact that, that, that there's been a lot of interest in extending that comment period, and I've never been one to try to close down public input on anything. So I am very sensitive to that, and I want to figure out how to find the best way possible to live within both of those things and find a way forward. So but I, it, I don't okay. have that answer at this very so moment. So I appreciate that. You know, to the extent we can, interact the plan and the locus process, it seems as if the locus process cannot have a fundamental impact on the plan. And, and so well, that, will, that's a problem. I don't want to interrupt you too much, but I will, I will say this. I, I, I'm sensitive to the fact I don't necessarily want the locus process to have a significant impact on the plan only because the plan went through a very significant public process, including a lot of people who aren't sitting around the table. So if this group around the table comes to the conclusion that you think something should change in the plan, I do have to make sure that also jives with what the rest of the community wanted to be or not be in the plan. So I need to, f I, I, I understand this issue and I'm, I'm trying to work with it the best I can, but it's not as simple as just saying, oh, I'll just move that date to January 31st and be done with it and I'll see what comes out of this group and we'll make a change because it may be a little more complicated than that, but I, I, I understand the concern. Uh, George, I and, uh, no, I got I got just one thing. I just want to distinguish between what you just said, we lining it up with locus is, I also agree, but the point I made earlier was different. We've waited for the fiscal analysis. We know the impact, and, and we know it was hard. We appreciate that. But uh, I just want to distinguish between the different issues. I, I will make sure, there will be a comment period on the fiscal analysis that will have to lag beyond yeah. the comment period. Yeah, so my point, that's not my point. I just, right. I just want to make my point, that's, which is that's I, think, I think the fiscal analysis was initially meant to be aligned with the plan. The locus idea is new. So I'm suggesting it's hard to comment on the plan without having the fiscal analysis. So that's my point. OK, now just a couple things on, um, I guess, just one thing. Um, the, the change in the goals for Union Square, I, I guess that's being attributed to the Union Square process. But really, the goals, uh, the comp plan goals for the city came out of a three-year public process with a lot of people sitting at the table. And generally, the rule is, if you want to change those conclusions, you reopen that process. Yes. That, that, you know, you, you don't unilaterally decide in City Hall um, to change, change the goals, you reopen the Which process. Which goals are you referring to? Well, I'm referring to, to the main goals that actually that Victoria put up early, the comp plans of the jobs goals, the housing goals, the affordable housing goals, the open space goals, and the transportation goals. Okay. All of those are now different in Union Square. Uh, but, um, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna ask you two questions here, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna ask you two questions here, and I'm gonna try to differentiate this difference with just two questions. What's the time frame for the comp plan? It runs till 2030, right? How long do you think it's gonna to take to build out Union Square and Point Yards? Well, that's fine, but then the comp plan committee should have thought to 2030. You, you don't just unilaterally add on I, I don't, a, a differently shaded set of goals. At no time, though, do I think that the intent of the comp plan committee was to say that we were going to build 30,000 jobs and 6,000 housing units by 2030 and stop and never build anything between 2030 and 2040. And all I'm saying is the Union Square Point Yard numbers are higher, most significantly, because they go beyond the time frame of the comp plan. Also, somewhat because we applied what I think was a very simplistic analysis as to where our growth would be. I do not think that implementing the Union Square Plan is going to cause us to wake up in 2030 and have more growth than the comp plan totals. 
I, I don't. I, I don't think it is. I, do you, I, I, if you feel differently, I'd like to. Well, then may, maybe the maybe the time frame of the comp plan was wrong, but we, we have changed some things. Uh, add, add build, added building density. We haven't added open space. I mean, we haven't stayed pro rata. So I'll stop there. No, no, I completely agree with you that we did not explain this well in the plan draft. Uh, but I, I, I feel that there is an, a, a, a detail here that we will address. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I, I had I had a few more people with hands up. So okay. All right. Sorry, everyone, to jump in. We do need to take a break. Food arrived um, about half hour ago, and it's getting cold very quickly. I did want to acknowledge while um, we have a few new people who joined us, and we can do a greater introductions when we come back, but we have um, three additional st strategy leaders who have joined us. Um, Regina is here with us. Patrick McMahon is here with us. And Courtney O'Keefe is here. I'd also like to acknowledge Alderman McWaters, who is here as well. And so once we all come back together, um, we will find seats for everyone and, and do a longer introduction for those strategy leaders. But um. Yes, um, it'll be a working dinner, so that means you eat and we don't, um, so um, we will uh, take 10 minutes to go get your food, bring it back, and then we'll start the presentation. Also, one thing is I'd like to introduce Mary Skelton Roberts from the Bar Foundation, who's coming to observe what we're up to, and she's our point person with the Bar Foundation. <coughs> Christopher, what was it? Uh, I was going to ask the guys if you could go first. Yes, good idea. And when you guys come back, when did the general public please follow up on the round? So. Okay, go. So, back here, five after six, we'll start. <laughs> 